Now moving on, Benjamin Bryant, our next guest, was on the Fort Hood Task Force. He's been a lead writer on the lessons learned that the military did after the Fort Hood shooting. And there's certainly been, there are a lot of comparisons that can already be made. A military installation, a reservist in this case who may have been welcome or at least had some understanding of security on a base. Can you bring us some information? What has been learned that may be helped in moving, as uh, Councilman Mendelson said, bringing these uh, law enforcement together and moving so quickly to stop the situation there? Well, as you can say, for people in the Pentagon, I imagine there are a lot of flashbacks right now. Uh, there are a lot of thoughts, a lot of parallels that jump to mind. But the thing that comes to my mind is probably, I think it was recommendation 4.3, which was active shooter situations, where we recognized at the time, and the co-chairs, uh, Togo West and uh, Vern Clark, uh, noted that the DOD hadn't really accepted or brought in, in a, an official way, uh, all the body of knowledge that was out there for active shooting. Since Columbine, we'd done uh, local law officials, FBI, scenarios, lessons learned, uh, best practices had been identified, and they hadn't been codified or brought in under the auspices of DOD's policy or So guidance. give us the example of that active mm -hmm. shooter situation. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, it, it might have seemed to those of us as outside observers, hey, it was a hodgepodge mm -hmm. that just ran a bunch of law enforcement mm -hmm. there, but you're saying there was actual plan here, active shooter plan. Oh, absolutely. That was the result that came out of 4.3. The result was that the DOD recognized that, in fact, the services had done some leadership on this, but what they recognized in the wake-up call that was Fort Hood was that we had to have a plan. We had to be adopting. We had to be reaching out and getting this fantastic body of knowledge, which involved, for example, neutralizing. Before, the old plan, as, as we note in the report, was when there's an active shooter there, you sort of hold tight and you call in the people who know what to do. And in an active shooter situation, what we've, what we've learned over time is what you need to do is you need to quickly identify and you need to neutralize that shooter. And so one of the things the military has become very good at is running those scenarios and planning for those kind of occurrences. And I, I hesitate to say that in this situation, there might have even been more lives lost. Best thing I heard, Joey, was when they said, we have contained the shooter, even though we have not captured him. When you, when you say identify mm -hmm. and neutralize, what do you mean by neutralize? Well, neutralize can mean any number of things. In this case, it primarily meant getting them away way where they can't kill people anymore. There are a lot of things. There's, there are a lot of scenarios that can happen from that point on, but what you want to do immediately is you want to stop the killing. You know, I take this very personally. I grew up in the military. You know, I often joke the first two decades of my life, every single thing I had was bought by the military, was paid for by the military. That was what shaped me. And when I hear that there's someone running around, and I know parents feel like this when there's someone on a school, on a school campus, or if someone's running around in a, in a highly populated area, you feel that threat very strongly. Neutralizing means stopping the killing. And, you know, there is a lot of indication, and, and I know that this came up very early in the coverage, mm -hmm. in the news coverage today. When you're looking at a breaking news situation where you don't have a lot of details right. yet, right. you have a shooter taking place at a military installation, mm -hmm. the possibility of there being additional shooters mm -hmm. as well. What comes to mind so quickly is, is this a terrorist attack? Of course it does. But the key thing to remember here is we can't get caught up on that, is it a terrorist attack in those moments. In fact, you may remember, one of the things that the co-chairs and the Fort Hood Task Force got knocked around a lot for was, how come this report isn't all about Islamic terrorism? How come this report isn't focusing on the terrorism? Well, I tell you what, we got a lot of good people working on, on terrorist issues. But what we knew was more likely to happen than to have a terrorist every few years pop up on a military base, more likely to happen were workplace violence issues, or domestic violence issues, or random acts that quickly escalate people who are mentally ill. And so in addressing that, what we really looked at is how do we make sure that when situations go out of control, where, where security is breached, where someone is acting in a way that is unacceptable and dangerous, how do we neutralize that? And if we get caught up in focusing on, hmm, is this a terrorist? That brings a lot of emotions into it. And, and in a situation like this where there do seem to be indications mm -hmm. that this individual had had previous encounters mm -hmm. with gun violence in public mm -hmm. environments, Environments. How could that have been missed? Well, see, there's a question. There. The question where was, was it missed by, there's so many people along the way you can see this. Was it missed by family? Was it missed by coworkers? Was it missed by the military was in, was he, when he was in the military? And the answer is we don't know. There are a lot of people who have a chance to see it, and there are a lot of reasons that different audiences choose not to see things that are right in front of their faces. But I think that one of the big takeaways from this is if you are out there 
board, if you see a situation escalating, if someone you love or if someone you work with, you know, is, is demonstrating risky behaviors, read up on them and talk to the right people. Don't gossip about it, but well, talk to the right people and get involved. Well, I have to ask you, wasn't there, weren't there more security alerts put in place after something like Fort mm -hmm. Hood where you knew that there was a potential for people, even people who work mm -hmm. for the military, mm -hmm. might have a situation where mm -hmm. their concentration is snapped, where their behavior is snapped, where... One thing that's very important to note here is that he was in the Ready Reserve. That's latest underst my understanding from Secretary Mabus. And the Ready Reserve is not the same thing as what we traditionally believe of as the reserves, where someone trains, you know, one weekend a month, a few weeks a year. The Ready Reserve is when you get out, but you're still eligible to be called back. You're no longer in the system in that traditional way that we tend to think of, where you're being screened by the military, where you're being treated in the military, and where you're being observed by the military on a regular basis. So I think that's important to note. So in the sense that I think the military has a tremendous job in being able to screen and more importantly teach peers to observe these behaviors and report them and feel comfortable reporting them but at the same time there's only so much you can control and that's why it's so impressive what they did when the shooting actually began they followed their Seven protocols minutes. saved lives yes mm -hmm. ben bryant thank you very much for coming in and talking with us giving us a little insight we'll continue with more of america tonight special coverage after a break